Passport Mommy with Michelle Gerson. Motherhood is both amazing and difficult at the same time. The Passport Mommy, Michelle Gerson, is here to share in your journey. It's amazing. It really is just watching them grow and see how much change and how much they learn just without the filters around them. Joining you on your greatest adventure, here's Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. Welcome to the show. I'm Michelle Jarson, the Passport Mommy. I hope you're having a great day. I hope you had a good week. I hope you're staying sane and healthy and enjoying this beautiful weather. I hope wherever you are that the weather is getting nicer for you. I know I'm here in the Northeast and I am enjoying getting outside. But what I really enjoyed was last week, my son turned one. And so we did a cake smash for him and we... That was about it because obviously we're not going anywhere, but we had our own little celebration at home and it was great. And one thing that I really wanted was a very cute outfit for him for his cake smash. And so for that, I turned to Etsy where I love finding small business owners and women who are doing really creative things. And I found Rachel Loomis. She is the maker at Guys and Ties based in Dallas. And I found a very cute shark bow tie, which I called, or she called baby shark bow tie. And I love it because that's all we do around here since I have a three-year-old is sing baby shark. And I loved it because I looked on pages and pages of Etsy to find a bow tie. And I liked it because it was a blue jean color and it matched his jean suspenders that he was wearing. And it just looked really cute. And it was perfect for the pictures. And what I was also thrilled to see is Rachel has started making masks as well. So with me today, I have Rachel Loomis. Thank you so much for joining me, Rachel. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about Guys and Ties and how and when you started the business. Yeah, so I actually started the business in 2013. Um, I had a young son myself. He had just turned one and I was searching endlessly at stores for a cute bow tie, kind of similar to the situation you just had (laughs) last week celebrating And I just, I was not satisfied with what I was seeing in stores. I wanted something cute, something different, something fun. So I took to my sewing machine and crafted up my own wild design for him to sport for his birthday. And it kind of just grew from there. That's great. That's incredible. And now you have so many different designs on your sites and you've also pivoted your business a little bit right now to the current situation and you're designing masks for kids and adults. Yes. I've taken on that endeavor. It's been, it was a great business opportunity for me to kind of transition, you know, making bow ties. It definitely took a dip, you know, there, I was, it was, couldn't have been a worse time. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was the worst time for everyone for this to hit, but I was entering into Easter season and I have made a lot of revenue off of um, Easter sales and Easter wasn't canceled, but essentially the dressing up part of it, you know, attending church and stuff like that was. So I took a dip with that, but I had the fabric inventory. I started to see the need, you know, across different social media platforms for face masks. So I kind of started crunching away, came up with a pattern that, you know, fit universally across myself, my parents, my brother, they were (laughs) my models and found a pattern that stuck and just started making them and people loved them and they've been coming. So I've been trying to get different designs and stuff out there that people enjoy to kind of take away, you know, the scary part of wearing a mask out in public. It's, been a weird transition for the acceptance of wearing masks in public now it's becoming a new normal instead of before you know maybe wearing a mask in public automatically indicated you know you were sick or yes something like that so just trying to (laughs) help bring a little bit of fashion into the mask world (laughs) Right. And I will say that for the first time, I I wore your mask the other day and I had Mm -hmm. just been wearing the plain surgical masks. And I was like, wow, this is nice. I feel, and it was, it was easy, breathable, you know, it was great. And you're right. I see people on social media posting their mask pictures all the time. Yeah. So what better way? I think that's great that you're doing this now. And so what is your background when you transitioned into this business? Did you come from this type of background? 
No, actually, it's funny. I was all about healthcare. I want, really wanted to um, dive into whether it was medicine or the nursing field. And all through high school and even college, I was always geared towards science, science, science. And I'd never once taken a business class. So when I entered into this entrepreneurship world, it was really a, you know, learn as you go. And um, it's been a fun, it's been a wild ride. I've definitely experienced, you know, the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. Um, Mm -hmm. I do credit a lot to my parents and brother who have supported me tremendously through this um, adventure that I've taken on. And it's, you know, if you stick to it and work through the hard times, you can definitely come on top, out on top on the other side. So, and it's been fun. <laughs> That's incredible. It's a little well, wild yes. right now. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're very lucky to have their support. And I also give you a tremendous amount of credit because on top of balancing this business, you have a two, a four and a seven year old. So I have to ask, yeah. where do you even have the time? Yeah, that's definitely where the wild part sets in right now. Um, I'm wearing many hats. I'm lucky to have uh, my brother close by, so he's kind of taken on the role as a uh, nanny. <laughs> oh, that's nice. He's been, yeah, and we've transitioned to also taking on the role of homeschooling. Thankfully, only my oldest, my son, my seven-year-old, is um, doing schoolwork from home. So we've had to navigate incorporating that into the days, but with him having two younger siblings running around, there's a lot of distractions that happen yeah. and sidetracking. So keeping up with them and I work from home as well. So it's, even though I have the help with taking care of them during the day, they easily, you know, come find me or try to sneak into my office and <laughs> distract me from my work easily. But it's just kind of a roller coaster. I think everyone's on right now. So yeah, Every day is absolutely. a little bit different, but I'm thankful for the work and I'm thankful that I'm still able to um, keep food on the table for my family and a roof over our head. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's amazing what you're doing. I mean, kudos, 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 because I know oh, I have a one and a three year old and I, I mean, I love them and I love spending time, of course, but I get nothing done for my business. And so yeah. it's, you know, it's frustrating. It's like, oh man. And it's like, you know, maybe 10 o'clock at night, if I'm not exhausted and falling asleep, oh yeah, I, I could get an hour or two in, but it's so challenging. So I, I give you so much credit for what you're doing for yourself and your family. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. I give the same to you. I think you're one step further on the hard scale because you have to do recordings and distractions and interruptions are definitely something harder to navigate around. Yeah. I get one, one hour that I have my husband who could watch them for one hour a week. So I could do this, (laughs) but, but normally when he used to go to work, um, I would have like, my daughter was in daycare, but my son was Uh on my lap. And it was, I would pray for him to be napping during this time. And if not, then it was an interesting radio show. (laughs) I've definitely been there as well. It's how much work can you cram in during nap time and preschool time, right? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So what are your plans moving forward for your business? What do you have on the horizon now? You have the masks and what else can people find when they go to Guys and Ties? Um. I am working on offering kids masks soon. I know as, you know, states start to open and more businesses are opening for people to be able to have access to, I want it, you know, not just the adults need to protect themselves when going out, kids as well. And I know um, that'll be important going forward. So I'm trying to, you know, kids sizes are kind of tricky to navigate when you're, especially for mm-hmm. math, you know, one could fit one three-year-old, but not so well the other three-year-old. So I'm trying right. to get the sizing right on that before I launch them on my site. Um, and since, you know, the face masks have become more of a fashion, I mean, they're, they're kind of dipping into like fashion, you know, people want to look nice <laughs> when they go out and right. they're literally picking designs, you know, to match their outfits. So I'm going to, <laughs> 
try to tie in the face mask with the bow ties. I've had a little bit of interest from some customers to have matching bow tie to face mask. So I think between kids masks and matching the bow tie face mask, I'll still stay pretty busy moving forward and yes, before I can I, fully transition back to the bow tie making. <laughs> right, right. Well, definitely, again, so creative with uh, you know how you figured out how to match them all. And I, I think it's great. I mean, I do love your designs and I know the masks that you sent. Thank you. They're a wonderful design. I love them. And so I, I think it's yeah. brilliant. So where could people go for more information and where to find your shop? Okay, yes. Yeah. So I am on Etsy, uh, www.guysandties, Etsy.com. Guysandties.com yeah. slash Etsy. Thank you. And again, I will say that when I was going through Etsy, if you are looking for a bow tie, the bow ties on your site were cute fashionable i would say not too flashy not too cheesy and really look really nicely made so thank you again for making the pictures of my uh, son's cake smash look so wonderful and so funny rachel loomis guys and ties i'm michelle juris in the past for mommy more coming up in a few Motherhood is a journey. Joining you on your greatest adventure, here's Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. Personally, I have to say that I have always been very aware of what's going on in my home. I'll tell you, I moved to a new home last year from the city into the suburbs, and I would wake up every morning with a stuffy nose. I was coughing. I had this cough that I had never had before. And so I said to my husband, I said, I think we need to get the vents cleaned. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And I brought somebody in and sure enough, they looked and they said, yes, you could definitely use a cleaning. But I feel like, especially now with COVID-19, we are so concerned about what we're bringing back into our house. And when we go outside, how to protect us. But do we really know what we're breathing inside our own homes and how to protect ourselves, whether we're during this pandemic or any other time of the year of, you know, any year, how do you keep your home healthy for you and your children? So today I have with me Carolyn Blazowski. She is a healthy home expert with a national reputation as one of the top residential consultants in the country. Her clients span from Maine to Alaska and everywhere in between. And for over 20 years, she has worked on the homes of the most famous to the everyday person who just wants to environmentally improve their living space. Carolyn, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Sure. So you must be so busy right now with everybody (laughs) super aware. (laughs) It's been a crazy experience and never did I think in a million years that a pandemic would sort of force healthy homes to the forefront. You know, I've been educating people for this time and all of these years. And then all of a sudden it just, it just blew us into the, into the limelight and healthy homes is like the number one searched, um, topic on the internet now and with social media. So it's been crazy. Wow. So tell me quickly, what is your background and what made you get into the home environmental testing field? It's been a long road. Um, In my 20s, I had allergies, nothing crazy. I worked in the city. I worked in New York City. And so um, I had just developed probably environmental allergies and I started to really investigate you know, what was the cause of those? And then I found that doctors really didn't have the answers. They, you would go and they'd say, take a pill, you know, you just have some congestion. And I would say, well, what's causing it? Why do I have it now? And they didn't have an answer. So I began investigating homes, you know, over 20 years ago, and I began with mold and allergens, and then obviously progressed into volatile organics and dander and dust mites and pests. And I mean, it just goes on. And now, you know, obviously COVID. And and so it's been a, it's been a big uh, boom and obviously just a growing industry for me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's such a great field that you're in and one that is so important because I feel like people don't really know what's going on in their own homes. And if they did, it might be a little scary. Yeah. And in my opinion, you know, from doing this for so long, I really believe 85% of disease states are, you know, originating from our environments. And the more you investigate, I've, you know, investigated 30,000 homes in my career. 
I really get a handle on, you know, what people are doing nationally and how they're, what their contaminants are and what they're bringing into the space and how that correlates to health. So to me, you know, our, my education and message has always been surrounding public health is check your environment. When you're doing an overall body check, you need to really know what's going on in that environment as well as a piece to that puzzle for your overall health. Yeah, absolutely. So what are the common issues that you see in most people's homes? Um, I mean, every house has its story. It's just like a person. So when you look at one person who may have maybe MS, and then the next person may have cancer and the other person has asthma, it's the same with a home. So every home has a different building structure, different contaminants. Some people have pesticide contamination. Some people have mycotoxin and mold. Some people have dust mite stander. Some people have high volatile organics. Some people have radon. So it's like this, it, and, and usually where I see a sick person or someone who's really unwell, they'll have multiple, what I call a trifecta, meaning they've got three or more things wrong at one time. And then the body says, hey, you know, I've had enough and it shuts down. So physicians and then, of course, patients and clients, you know, hire me to come in and kind of look at those environments and say, okay, well, what's going on here and what can we improve on to see if the patient gets better? Right. Now, you mentioned pesticide just now. Now, I had to, against my better judgment and against what I firmly believe in keeping your environment as natural as you can inside, I had to bring in an exterminator. And I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and he did pesticides in the baseboards. And I'm worried more than the actual (laughs) pets itself, the fact that this went on. What do I need to do now? Or what what should my concerns be for now and the future? Yeah, that, it's a good question. And so if I would have, you know, spoken to you previously, I would have asked a lot of a pest is just like a person, right? It needs air and water and food to proliferate and grow and want to stay in that environment. So a lot of the times it's your moisture content in a home. So it's really important for someone to look at their relative humidity all the time, more so than temperature. I mean, I really, when I start investigating homes, one of the key things that I want to see is what's that moisture content and I want people to stay between 30 and 50%. And this is the key to healthy homes in general. It's keeping relative humidity low so that you reduce things like pests and mold and dust mites. And then, of course, also you'll release less chemicals into the air with a, a lower RH. Um, mm-hmm. And then also, you know, with the virus, with COVID, it's really important now that we're looking at this moisture number. Because if we're on the higher side, we know the virus proliferates less. So um, you don't want to go too dry. So, um, but that's the first thing I would have had you look at is your moisture when it comes to bugs. And I want you to do that moving forward. So you don't have to, you know, have a, an is- instance where you have to use pesticide again. <laughs> okay. So how does, we know what we're coming up against the clock for this segment, but I want to know in the next segment, how does one test their moisture and what are some other things that we should be testing for? And is it something we can do on our own or do we bring somebody like you in? We're speaking with Carolyn Blazowski. She is a healthy home expert with a national reputation. She has helped so many people, as you heard, over 30,000 homes. So she's going to talk to us more coming up. I'm Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. Passport Mommy with Michelle Gerson. Motherhood is a journey. Joining you on your greatest adventure, here's Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. Thrilled to have with me Carolyn Blazowski. She is a healthy home expert. She goes into people's homes and she will tell you what you need to do to maximize the health and wellness of you and your family because you don't know. Maybe you're buying a new home. You need to know what to look for when you are purchasing that new home. And right before the break, we were talking about the fact that it is the season where we see so many bugs inside our home. So what are the important points to try to minimize that? And also with the COVID-19 pandemic, how to try to make sure that that virus doesn't proliferate within your home. Hi, Carolyn. Hi. So yeah, Go ahead. Oh, no. So before the break, we were talking about moisture levels. So yeah, you want to really maintain a moisture level between 30 and 50%. And and what that is, is you go down to a local hardware store and you pick up what's called a hygrometer. And some people have them. If you have a Nest system built into your home, you'll have an automatic read on your relative humidity inside the home and outside. And it's just a little monitor that tells you the temperature. And then it's also going to tell you your RH in a percentage. You want to stay between 30 and 50%. Now with the virus and 
the evidence that the virus really slows when we have higher relative humidity, I'm advising clients to run on the higher side. So 35 to 55, even 60%. But once the virus is gone, you go back to that 30 to 50. Um, And that's because all of this, controlling your moisture in a home is key to controlling dust mites. You control bugs so you don't have to spray pesticide. You control mold growth. And it really keeps your home healthy by simply just keeping your RH between that level of 30 to 50%. Got it. Very helpful. Now, if somebody is looking to buy a new home before they make that purchase, I know we have the home inspection, but a lot of times that home inspector is not looking for the things that we should be looking for. And they're looking for a lot of the main things, but what else should we be concerned with? Exactly. And so with my clients, I advise a a different kind of contract to be written. And so that is that I like to see a mold test first and a water test before you proceed with any other inspections. Because to me, why would you want to pay for inspections that are going to be dependent on two things that you are going to be expensive fixes on the back end and then potentially fixes that you can't change. So with your water supply. So I always write in the contract to make sure that you're going to do a mold and water test. And if those tests come back, acceptable to the buyer, then you proceed. So never buy a home without water and mold. It's really key. You need testing in both. Okay, great. That's really, really helpful. And then what about radon? I know that's a big thing that people should definitely test for. Yeah. And you'll definitely test for that during your inspection. I mean, radon is in all 50 states across the country. So it's really important to test for it you know, obviously when you're purchasing a home, but if you do any remodeling, adding slabs, concrete foundations, you tighten your building envelope, that means adding siding or energy efficiency in any capacity, then you want to repeat your radon test. Because what happens is suddenly you don't have a radon test when the house is breathing effectively, and then you close it up, make it much more energy efficient. And all of a sudden, boom, you have a radon issue. So it's real important to test for that, you know, if you make any changes to the home and that you want to be under four pico curies, that's, you know, the safe level. Ideally, you want to shoot for none of of a radon gas because it is carcinogenic. But if you have under the four pico curies, um, the EPA says that's okay. Right. Now, if you're just renting and let's say you rent for a year, do you still recommend doing the radon check because it's still your health? Um, Yeah. I mean, if it's, if you know, I, I always tell people that, you know, when they rent that they should be concerned about, you know, where they're living. I think it depends on the time that you're going to be there. And, you know, the duration, if it's a short, you know, six month to a year lease, you may not be as concerned. But if you're definitely going to do a three year lease, you'll want to definitely do maybe a mold test and then a radon test to just make sure everything's okay. Or ask your landlord if they did perform one, you know, pri- previously. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so as far as air quality, What are 10 ways that we can improve air quality? I've seen a few listed out there and I had mentioned getting our vents cleaned and that was something that I really wanted to do. And my husband said, oh, you don't need to get your vents cleaned. And I feel like people poo-poo that. What do you consider very important? Um, Well, the first thing is do not wear shoes in the house. If we've learned anything from COVID, this is the time you go out, you track things in, not and not just the virus itself um, and the particulate, but molds, pesticides, petroleum products. You need to have outside shoes only and inside shoes. That's the first thing. Okay. Um, Secondly, I would like people now, especially in the times that we're in, to apply some type of UVC technology that can be anything from ultraviolet light to your phone, using a UVC wand, and even installing it in the ductwork. We've been using UVC technology in ductwork since 2005, and that basically allows the UV light to pass over the air and to kill viruses and bacteria, which is really helpful, especially at this time. So that's important. And of course, changing your filters, making sure that you are staying up to date, using MERV 8 or above whenever possible in your HVAC system. So use a good efficiency, you know, high quality filter. Controlling your relative humidity, as we talked about, staying between 30 and 50% is key. We don't want to have too much moisture in the home that contributes to allergies. So we want to keep that within, you know, range. Also, Put in any type of filtration system that you can. So HEPA filtration is important. Whenever you can use filtration, whether it's in a dehumidifier, whether you use it in your HVAC system, on your vacuum, that's highly important. And then vacuuming as many times a week as you have people in the home. So for example, if you have two adults and two pets, you want to make sure you're going to have to vacuum four times a week. And I know that drives people crazy, but that's my little formula for you to know that you are collecting your dust mites and dander and things like that. So you have to make sure you're vacuuming effectively. Oh, you should talk to my husband because we argue about this daily. 
And I say, and we're in a pretty large home right now, which I love, but I hate because it is to vacuum this entire home is such a project. I'm glad you mentioned about vacuuming because I feel like that's something that gets overlooked when it comes to household cleaning. And many people think they could just vacuum maybe once a week, once every other week. How do you get your clients to just be really diligent with it? Because again, it could be a lot of work to vacuum that often. It is. And now we've, you know, I always want to make sure they're using HEPA vacuum. That's important. Important. So when you are vacuuming, at least you're vacuuming effectively and you want a sealed vacuum to make sure like if you're opening up your vacuum and you're looking inside and you see dust outside of the bag, for example, that's a no, no. That means you're going to have to vacuum five more times than you had to. So you want to make sure that system's sealed and all the dust is staying where it's supposed to. And then if it's really hard for you, go to one of the Roomba systems. They have a new one, which has HEPA filtration. It has its own port where it'll actually dump all the debris into a sealed system, which is fantastic. So, you know, if you can't get to it as frequently, pick up one of the, the, you know, ones that go automatically for you, at least for, you know, your basic stuff. And then you can do a really good vacuuming thoroughly, like two times a week or once a week. That's good advice. I did pick up a Roomba a while ago and I think it was because because I was in a small apartment and it just kept banging into everything. <laughs> and I said, I don't think this is working effectively, but I think if you have nice open rooms, it's a great solution. I think they've gotten a little better too. So like the newer, I mean, the newer one's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is hard, especially if you have kids and you've got toys everywhere and you know, this thing can't go, but if you can put it in at least some rooms that are yeah. you know not as occupied, it's, I think it's better to at least try. So we have the vacuuming, anything else that we should know of as far as keeping, what about air purifiers? Are there certain ones that you find more effective? Yeah. I mean, definitely I like purification. I don't use it a lot. The places that I use it, I I really want you to scientifically look at what's going on in your house. So I'm always testing to find out what's actually wrong because every purifier is different and every problem requires sort of a different solution. So with purifiers, it's important that if you do have one, you have to change it. That's my number one concern. Because if you don't change your filter according to the instructions and you keep a dirty filter, you're keeping all those contaminants right in your space and it's not a closed system. So for example, I learned a while ago that when we did remediation, if we didn't remove the filter and it had any kind of contaminant, the client would continue to have asthma or allergies. And that was because the contaminant was still escaping into the space. So you've Mm got to change the filters regularly if you use them. And with HEPA filtration, it's really um, a great thing to use as far as health for health. We know that using HEPA filtration and reducing particulate actually helps with cognitive health. It improves cognitive function significantly in the elderly and then also decreases your chances for dementia and and Alzheimer's symptoms. Mm -hmm. And then also it helps with cardiovascular function. So you can get quite a bit of cardiovascular improvement if you use HEPA filtration. And then what about water? Because we've talked about our air quality. What about our water quality? Do you feel that we should have the filter, the standalone filters, a Brita filter, or one of, you know, is the refrigerator filters enough? No, you definitely need to have a better filtration system if your water needs it. So that's another thing, like you have to test, you can't just apply a filter and say, okay, well, this is going to solve the problem. You need to know what you scientifically have in your water. And I recommend doing that every three years um, or so to kind of make sure that, you know, you don't have high levels of Um, particulate ending up in the water or chlorination byproduct if you're in the city or high chlorination levels. So what leaves the plant isn't necessarily what you get. And then of course, if you have a well, then it's a different story altogether. But you should be checking your water every three years and also doing a mold test every three years in the house just to make sure that you don't have any significant problems going on that you can't see. Okay. And for those checks, is that something that you bring somebody in for? Is it something you can do yourself? Yeah. I mean, water testing, um, like our clients call us and we just send them out their water kits and basically they receive it and then it comes back to our lab and we have it within you know a week or so. Same thing with the mold. There's a great website you can visit. It's called examiner, E-X-A-M-I-N-A-I-R.com. You can actually get a mold and allergen kit and do it all yourself. And you know you just order it. They ship it to you. You take a couple samples in the house. It's an air pump sampler. Then that goes back to the lab and you have the results within two days. So you'll know wow. it's a professional test. You can know mold, toxic mold, dander, dust mites, all these wonderful things. And it's a great thing to do now because we're home. So people can easily just you know find out what their air quality is and start making adjustments to make it better if they need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what about, um, you had said something about a probiotic. Um, Well, I'm not a big fan of the probiotic. It's something that they've started to push a lot and spraying it into the air. So it's something you can look into. Yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely become more of something that's talked about. 
Yeah. But I'm I'm really into the science behind indoor air quality. So I'm into testing, knowing exactly what you have, and then solving the problems and and watching it also improve your health. So, you know, a lot of the stuff we do is really state of the art. And obviously, we've been doing it 20 years. So we have got a pretty good handle on, you know, what homes are like and, and what's happening in, in them across the country. Right. So can somebody bring in you to a house that they're thinking about buying before they mm-hmm. buy it to do those tests? Sure. Mm-hmm. I do all kinds of consults, whether it's people who are sick, some people want to do a green build. Um, a lot of the things, it's amazing what we do at Zoom now. I mean, I have clients in Australia and all over the world. So it's, you know, we go on Zoom and they walk me through their house. I do an inspection just like I normally would. And then we make, you know, recommendations, do testing, test water, test air. It's it's incredible, actually. But, but we were doing that before COVID. But COVID just, you know, has pushed it even more into the forefront for people who are here and need the help. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked before about pesticides. And if you are forced to spray, um, what is there any measures that you should take after the fact to try to get your home back to being as healthy as it can be? Well, I'm 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 a no for residential pesticide in general. So I'm the wrong person to ask. I don't think that anybody should be using um, a neurotoxin in their home. But um, there's a lot of great solutions. You can use a surfactant, which is soap, um, with a salt solution and a vinegar solution. You can make it up yourself. If you go on the internet and you type in, um, you know, natural pesticides, natural herbicides, they come up. So you can use a boric acid if you want to do ants or you want to do carpenter ants, things like that. They're natural and they are highly effective. So I don't really think that there's a reason for people to be using them. Um, and especially don't do it yourself. I mean, if you have to do it, then you obviously want to call an inspector in, but really try some of the, re- the natural remedies. They 100% work and we've been using them and recommending them for years. That's good to know because when I did speak with an exterminator and I asked him about the boric acid, they said, oh, you, that's dangerous. You shouldn't be using that yourself. Yeah, and they, I kept they, reading conflicting. Yeah, they, it's the boric acid works fantastic. And there's a lot of company, bait companies that actually make it. And you don't, you know, a lot of pests, like especially things like the, the carpenter ants and the black ants, they don't really nest in the home. Their nests are traditionally outside. So you have to kind of go outside and find it. I had a carpenter ant infiltration um, where my building is. It's an 1800s building. So obviously mm-hmm. it's old. Right. And um, we went out and found the nest. And sure enough, it was right outside the window and we treated it. They have, um, I can't remember the company that makes them, but they make a great fork trap and you just put it right in and they were gone within, you know, two days. It was fantastic. Wow. So that's great. Have you ever dealt with carpet beetles? Water. <laughs> they love water. So that's like, if you have them, you have to knock out your water source. And especially with basements, anything from, you know, spiders to, the centipedes, millipedes, you know, ants, all of that stuff, they really come from moisture. So if you can dry it out with a dehumidification system, you're going to be a lot better. They're not going to come in. So right. try, you know, really look at your moisture content and measure that RH. Well, man, Carolyn, thank you so much. What helpful information. I'm so glad that we spoke today because I think a lot of people are going to go out, get the kits. Where can they go for more information on you and just to learn more about everything that they should be doing for their home? Sure. They can visit us at healthyhomeexpert.com. And obviously on social media, if you just type in healthy home expert, you can go on Instagram. We're there. And then also the name of my company is actually my healthy home. So you can obviously Google us there as well and you'll find us. All right. Carolyn Blazowski, thank you so much again for joining me today. I'm Michelle Jerson, the Passport Mommy. Motherhood is a journey. Joining you on your greatest adventure, here's Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. So I feel like during this coronavirus pandemic, a lot of people have thought about, hey, they want to help each other. I've seen posts all the time about if you need somebody to go grocery shopping or can I help you with this? Can I help you with that? It's really been the silver lining through this all. For many people, though, there seems to be little that they can do to help, say, scientists find medical treatments for coronavirus, or they might be unsure how to get involved in the fight against COVID-19. 
Well, that just changed because volunteers are now coming together to help scientists seek drug candidates that might help treat COVID-19. The World Community Grid is a project hosted by IBM where anyone with internet access can now help scientists from the comfort of their own home. They don't need a medical degree. And for that, I have with me today, Ms. Juwan Hindo. She is a corporate social responsibility manager for IBM to tell us all about this really neat project. Hello, Juwan. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for having me. What is the World Community Grid? How does it work? World Community Grid really is a way for anyone to help scientists who are trying to tackle all kinds of problems. So if I take the example you mentioned, uh, which is our latest project called Open Pandemics, we've partnered with researchers at Scripps in California who are looking for treatment options for COVID-19. So to do that, you would have to figure out which chemical compound could work against the disease. But there's literally millions to choose from. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really not that practical for them to do all of that testing in a traditional laboratory. That would be super expensive and would take years, maybe even decades. That's not what you would do, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Researchers instead can simulate what would happen in a traditional lab with a computer. So they have software that can mimic real tr um, traditional lab experiments. Um, and this means they can skip a lot of the trial and error phase of the research and kind of get pointed in the right direction. Um, the challenge with these simulation tools, though, is that they need a ton of processing power. And scientists typically don't get the luxury of having their own supercomputer. And right. that's where we come in. Um, so this is an opportunity for the scientists at Scripps Research to take these millions of simulation and distribute them amongst our volunteer community. And for each World Community Grid volunteer, they install our application on their device. And when your computer, for example, isn't doing much, so while you and I are chatting right now, my mm -hmm. computer isn't really that busy. So in the background, it's actually running one of the simulations on behalf of the researchers at Scripps. So who can participate in this? Anyone, anywhere. That's the beauty of this model. Um, as you mentioned, you don't sort of need any kind of specific scientific or technical background. All you need is a computer, an Android phone or tablet, or a Raspberry Pi device, and an internet connection. And you're good to go. Um, and all you do is uh, install the software on your device. I'm sure you've done projects like this in the past using this technology. What types of results have you seen in the past from such projects? Over the years, we've had over 780,000 people and 450 organizations donating uh, millions of years worth of computing power. Think of us as kind of a big um, virtual supercomputer. And through their contribution, we've been able to help scientists discover treatment options for childhood cancer, uh, find new materials for solar cells, uh, more efficient ways of filtering water. So it's pretty incredible to see what happens when our volunteer community kind of comes together and rallies behind research efforts like this. So tell me again, just, I mean, I think people realize why this mission is so important, but what need does it fill within the science community? I know you had mentioned that it's just impossible for scientists to do so much on their own. Yeah, for each of our research partners, uh, they get to do research that would otherwise take years and decades in a fraction of the time. But importantly, they get to do it at a scale that honestly, they probably wouldn't even contemplate um, without a resource like this. We also have an open data policy. So um, each of our research partners commits to making all of the results that come out of their work on World Community Grid publicly available. So okay. as a volunteer, your contribution isn't just benefiting the immediate research partner, but the wider scientific community. So where can listeners go for more information and to get involved? Uh, worldcommunitygrid.org. And we'd love to welcome your listeners to our volunteer community. The more people that join, the quicker we can 
get this research done. Ms. Juan Hindo, thank you so much for joining me today. So interesting. I can't wait to log on and to read more about this. What an extremely interesting project and a great way for people to jump on board to help find a cure and, and get rid of this COVID-19 so we can all move on with our lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. I'm Michelle Gerson, the Passport Mommy. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy. Stay healthy.